For I am crucified with Christ And yet I live Embrace the cross Where Jesus Welcome to Crossbound Ministries where we are bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world, encouraging Christians and pointing sinners to the cross. Will you please pray about supporting our broadcast and ministry that gives us the ability to spread God's word. You can get involved by going to crossboundministry.com. Please welcome our preacher, Mike Sadler, as he brings us an important message from God's word. Praise the Lord. Praise the love. Requires cling to the one Amen. Thank you for tuning in today. If you want to follow along with us in your Bible, we're in John chapter 6 and verse 52 is where we'll start. While you're turning there, I want to invite you to go to our website, crossboundministry.com, and sign up for our newsletter at the bottom of the page. And by doing so, I'll send you a free e-booklet on Six things that happen to a Christian immediately after they die. Six things that happen to a Christian right after they die. Amen. So in John chapter 6 and verse 52, as we've been going through the gospel of John and what a glorious book it is. John chapter 6 verse 52, the Jews therefore strove among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat. And if you look at that from a human standpoint, you go, wow, that is kind of, what in the world is he talking about? Give us his flesh to eat and his blood to drink? You go, oh, man. But they're, they're, they're thinking of literal flesh, literal blood. And that's not what Jesus was talking about. He wasn't talking about eating his physical body or drinking his physical blood. He most certainly wasn't. They did not realize that the Lord Jesus was using physical things to teach spiritual truths. Amen. And so they asked among themselves, how is this mere man? Could he possibly give us his flesh to be eaten? But you know, when you step out on faith, when a person gets saved, they're saved by faith. Amen. Faith in what? Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But by faith, you have to step out on faith, just like a Christian has to step out on faith when following God's will. But can I say to you, if you were going to jump out of an airplane, you had a parachute on your back, that parachute is not going to open up while you're in the plane. That parachute is going to open up when you jump out of the plane and in faith, you took faith, this parachute's going to open, but it's not going to open until you jump out. And when you jump out before you are acting in faith, faith precedes sight and prepares your soul to understand your heart to believe and you will obey amen faith is a powerful thing if you put your faith and trust in the right things all your questions of how how and why you know what they're answered when you yield to the authority of Christ just as Paul did when he cried Lord what do you want me to do you and me need to be asking God the same question Lord what would you have me to do and let's just say you're a stay-at-home mom or, or dad, a dad that just works a, a regular job hey listen to me when you are raising your family you are raising a army for God amen when you raise them in the right home in the right atmosphere with the right example amen Hey, you are raising an army for God. You do not know what they are going to do or what God's going to do with them in your life. And by the way, there is nothing, nothing more powerful than the influence of parents in their kids' lives. A stay-at-home mom, man, that is amazing. And that's what God wants. He wants us to raise our children to honor and glory the Lord. Amen. That they can go forth and live and do the same thing. So you remember that when you're raising your kids. You are raising an army me for God. Amen. Verse 53, then Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Now I want to explain something to you. The disciples partook of the bread and the wine and 
at the last supper, but they did not literally eat his flesh and drink his blood. No, you see, God was using that, a physical thing, to teach a spiritual truth. Amen. The Lord Jesus was simply stating that unless we appropriate to ourselves by faith the value of his death on Calvary, hey, we can't be saved. Amen. We must believe on him, receive him, trust him, and make him our very own. And it gets even deeper than that as we go along. Verse 54, whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now I want to convert Compare verse 54 with verse 47 of this chapter. And verse 47 tells you, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Amen. And he's telling you here, Whoso eat my flesh and drink my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day day. You know, when you eat something, when a bodybuilder eats lean meat, lean chicken breast, and he works out, that meat that he consumes becomes part of him. Your body uses it to build cells, to build muscle, to get bigger. You see, it becomes literally a part of that person. And listen to me, when you believe and you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, Jesus literally becomes a part of you. Literally a piece of the Holy Spirit moves in and it becomes a part of you. Amen. It is in you. It dwells in you. It's your God. It's your comforter. Amen. It's your seal unto salvation and thank God for it. And so we learn that Whoever eats his flesh and drinks his blood has eternal life. Now things equal to the same thing are equal to each other. Amen. To eat his flesh and to drink his blood is to believe on him. And that's what this verse is talking about. He is using it. Hey, believe on me. And you know, when when you consume it, it becomes part of you, right? Just like that analogy. Amen. And that's what he's telling you. Verse 55, for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink. The flesh of the Lord Jesus is food indeed, and his blood is drink. It is. The value of the death of the Lord Jesus is it's a never-ending value. Those who partake of him by faith receive life that goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. And even when this body dies and it goes in the ground, oh, this body might die, but you're not going to die. No. If you'll sign up for that free e-booklet, you will see exactly what happens to a Christian after they die. Amen. But just in the last part of that verse, last verse said, verse 54, and I will raise him up at the last day. Hey, that's when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back for his church. That's when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back for those that have put their faith and trust in him. Oh, what a glorious day that will be. You see, your soul will immediately go to be with the Lord, but this body will be buried. But on that day, when Jesus come back, when the trumpet is sound, amen, the Bible says that that body will be raised out of the ground that will meet you in the air, and that's when you will receive a glorified body. It says those that are still here on earth will be caught up like we are, be caught up in the clouds, amen. What a glorious day that will be, and how I long to see my Savior coming for us. Verse 56, he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Whosoever eats his flesh and drinks his blood abides in him, and he abides in that person. He's a part of you, and you are a part of him. He dwells in you. He's a piece of you. Amen. Nothing could be closer or more intimate than this. And that's what he wants. He wants fellowship with you. There, You know, there is nothing else that God has ever sent his son to die for. Nothing else, the angels that fell from heaven, the devils and the demons have no way of redemption, no way of salvation, but God loved you and me so much that he sent his son to die on that cross that our fellowship may be restored with him through the Lord Jesus Christ. And like that verse says, he dwelleth in me and I in 
him and he dwells in you if you are saved, if you are born again. Amen. And there is nothing could be more intimate than that. When we eat literal food, we take it into our very being and it becomes a part of us. And when you take Jesus and he he, grow, he goes inside of you, the peace of that Holy Spirit, and you are saved, he is literally a piece of you. He will be your guide. He will be your comforter. He will be all that you need, most certainly. He satisfies and nothing satisfies like the Lord Jesus. Amen. Verse 57 As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Amen. The living Father sent him. He sent him for for us to redeem us, to redeem our fellowship that we may get to go to heaven, that we can have fellowship with God. Jesus is our intercessor. And the illustration was his own connection with God the Father. The living Father had sent the Lord Jesus into the world. The expression living Father means the Father who is the source of life, the giver of life. And he gave Jesus. Jesus is life. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man come to the Father but by me. Amen. And so as a man here in the world, Jesus lived because of the Father. That is, by reason of the Father, his life was lived in closest union and harmony with God. God was the center, the center of everything that he did. God's purpose was to be occupied with God the Father. And we should have that same We want to be fully occupied with the Lord Jesus Christ, that everything that we do may be of his will. Amen. He was here as a man in the world, and the world didn't realize that he was God manifest in the flesh. Although he was misunderstood by the world, yet he and his father were were one. Amen. They are one one. That is exactly the way it is with the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. They are here in the world. We're misunderstood by the world. We're hated often, even persecuted often, but because we have put the faith, our faith in the Lord Jesus, he lives in us and we have close fellowship with him. Amen. Intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And that's what he wants. That's why he came, that he may seek and to save that which is lost. Amen. And he wants you. You say, I You don't know where I came from. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what happened. You don't know what they did to me. Listen to me. The blood of Jesus Christ is powerful enough not to cover up any sin, but to wash away any sin. And matter of fact, it's so powerful when you stand before God, he won't even see you. He will see his son who is perfect, who is holy, who is righteous. Amen. You are covered in the blood. Amen. There is no better place to be than covered in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for him to be in you and you in him. Amen. Verse 58. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Hey, he's talking about the bread when the Israelites were walking around in the desert. They were sustained by manna that came down from heaven each and every day. That was fresh manna they had, and it sustained them. But yet, as this verse said, and are dead, they still died. So even with the best food ever, food from heaven, with food that was that nutritious, their body still died. So no matter how good your diet is today, whether you're a vegan or a vegetarian or whatever it is, if you're an, an exercise maniac, one day this body is still going to die. The Bible does say what exercise profit if little. It doesn't say it profit if nothing. It is good for you. Absolutely. Amen. If you're able, you should exercise amen but this body is still going to die even with the best food with manna coming down from heaven amen it still died but jesus is telling here he that eateth of this bread shall live forever and he's talking about himself he's talking about his body he's talking about him will you consume him by faith will you believe on him and he becomes part 
of you. And so this verse seems to summarize all that the Lord has said in the previous verses. He is the bread which came down from heaven. He is superior to the manna which the fathers ate in the wilderness. That bread was only a, of temporary value. It was only for this life right now. But Christ is the bread of God who gives eternal life to all that will take him, who to all that would feed on him. Amen. He wants you to have that eternal life. Verse 59, these things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Hey, the, the crowd had followed Jesus and his disciples to Capernaum from the northeast side of the Sea of Galilee. Apparently, the multitude had found Jesus in the synagogue, and it was there that he delivered the message on the bread of life. Now, take that. Where was Jesus going? Where was Jesus going to preach? Jesus was going to the synagogue. He was going to the sinners. He was going to those, even the religious people that thought they had it all, but they really had nothing, amen, Jesus went to them and preached. He went out to the highways and the byways. He even went to the prisons and preached, the Bible says, amen. So he went to where they are, amen. I guess you could compare it to going to a Catholic church or, or somewhere like that. Jesus would march in there and start preaching the truth, amen. And so here he is in the synagogue preaching and teaching. And verse 60 Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? This is his disciples saying this now. This is not the people that are just off in the crowd listening. No, it says, Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Can hear it. Now, these are the ones that had been following him around, that they were followers of Jesus Christ, saying, This is a hard statement. And if you're honest with yourself, there are some hard things in the Bible. Even if you're saved, even if you're born again, there are some hard things. It's just you go, Wow, when it says all things are good for you, all things are profitable unto you. Amen. You go, What? The, the bad things that are happening? How can that be good to me? Now, to me, that could be a hard saying. Amen. But here, Jesus is talking about himself and his disciples said, this is a hard thing. By this time, the Lord Jesus had many more disciples than those original 12. Oh, there was many more. Anyone who had followed him and professed to accept his teachings and was known, he was, they were known as his disciple. However, not all that were known as the disciples were real believers. Amen to that. Not all that claimed to be disciples were real believers. You know what the Bible says about that. When they stand before God, he says many, not just a couple, not just two or three, but many, many that profess. They will stand before him and say, Lord, we've done many mighty works in your name. We've cast out devils and demons, amen, in your name. Can I just say, I, I've never even met a preacher that has cast out a demon or devil, amen, but this here, these people are gonna stand before God and say that, hey, we've cast out devils and demons and done many great works in thy name. But you see, they had never truly taken of Jesus. They had never truly eaten his bread and drank in his blood. They had never truly repented and put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like I talked about that parachute, it does, while you're in the plane, hey, that doesn't take no faith. But when you jump out of the plane, you, that, that takes all kind of faith that that parachute is going to open. But that's when faith kicks in, when you jump out on faith. Amen. But those people, many in that day will stand before him and say, hey, we've done great works in your name cast out devils and demons. We worked all our life. We went to church every Sunday. We tithed. We were good to people. We worked hard. We had a nice home, a good family. He's going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And iniquity is wickedness because the Bible says no matter how good we think we are. You say, we want to think we're good. And I even look around. I think, well, they're pretty good. Well, this and that. But I don't have God's standards, you see. God is going to judge 
judge us by his standards, by his book, by his Bible, amen? And that's where God gets his standards. And when you take that and you hold that mirror up, the Bible, and you look into that mirror, you realize what a sinner you truly are, amen? And that all need to be saved. So make sure that you know that you know that you know that you have been born. Again, don't worry about what people think or who's going to say what because they're not going to be there when you stand before God. You're going to give an account for yourself. Amen. He says, many, many will say unto me, I've done great works and cast out devils and demons and I say, I never knew you. Amen. That should scare somebody if they're not saved or if they doubt, doubt, got doubts. Amen. Get it right. Amen. Don't wait. And so now, Many of those who profess to be disciples said, this is a hard saying. They meant that his teachings were offensive. Amen. And the Bible is offensive to a sinner. It was very offensive to me before I got saved. Amen. It was offensive. Why? Because it went against my human nature. The things that I love, the things that I like, the things that I held of great value of this world, money and power. And it means nothing. And the Bible says it means nothing. Amen. But when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, hey, that means everything. And so it was not so much that it was hard for them to understand as that it was distasteful. They didn't like it. It rubbed them the wrong way. Amen. It made all their hair stand up. I don't like that. It goes against what I want. So who can understand it? Literally here, literally here they met. Who can stand and listen to such offensive doctrine is what they're saying. Hey, we don't like that. We don't want that. That's not what we want. Hey, we, we just want to come to church and, and sit in the pew and tithe and be good people. But Jesus said we're all sinners. Amen. All must be born again. Now, these were disciples, it says, that were following him. Amen. And they said, this is a hard Saying why? Because it was seriously offensive to them. What? You mean we're a sinner? We're not that good? What? He says, this is hard. Who can say it? But the Bible says that you've got to humble yourself and realize and realize that you truly are a sinner in need of a savior. And there is nothing that you can do to earn it. No matter how much you give or how good you are, you cannot earn it. It can only be given through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus knew himself that his disciples murmured at him, he said unto them, doth this offend you? Yes, it did. Here again, we find evidence that the Lord had complete knowledge. Hey, he knew. He said, hey, does this offend you? He's asking them. He's wanting them to think about their answer, to think about themselves, what's going on in their heart. Does this offend you? Jesus knew exactly what the disciples were saying. He knew that they were complaining at his claim to have come down from heaven and that they did not like it when he said that men must eat flesh and drink blood to have everlasting life. And so he asked them, does this offend you? He knew the answer. He knew what was going on. But many times in the Bible, when Jesus wanted somebody to really think and really look at themselves, he would ask them a question. And he said, does this offend you? And I'm here today to ask you, does this message offend you? Does it rub you the wrong way? Does it make your hair stand up? Hey, I don't do it to offend you. I do it because I love you. Because, you know, one day I had to realize that, hey, that I'm a sorry sinner in need of a Savior, no matter how good I think I am. Amen. And so did it offend me at that time? Yes, it did. But one day I realized it and I put it down. I said, Lord Jesus, today is the day I'm going to repent of my sins and put my faith and trust in you. And it was the best day of my life. And that's what I want for you. Amen. Repent of your sins and put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray you have been blessed by today's message. If you have been saved or are in need of a prayer, please contact us at 352-247-9200. That's 352-247-9200. Thank you for tuning into Crossbound Ministry Radio Broadcast. Will you please pray about supporting our ministry and broadcast? You can go to crossboundministry.com or send your support or gift to P.O. Box 7, Inverness, Florida, 34451. That's P.O. Box 7, Inverness, Florida, 34451. 
For a gift of $25 or more, we will send you a copy of Ray Comfort's book, Nothing Created Everything. Please pray for us as our ministry and radio broadcast grows. Tune in every Sunday morning at 8 a.m. to hear a message from our preacher, Mike Sadler. You can follow Crossbound Ministry on Facebook or visit us on the web at crossboundministry.com. If you are a woman in need of help with the With your pregnancy, there is hope. You can reach out to the Citrus Pregnancy Center. There's locations in Inverness and Crystal River. Their phone number is 352-341-5176. That's 352-341-5176. This broadcast has been sponsored in part by Henley's Grading Incorporated. For all your land clearing and hauling needs, located in Hernando, Florida, 352-897-3507. And Bruce Kaufman Construction, providing all your home building needs, 352-400-0230. This program is sponsored by Crossbound Ministry of Inverness, Florida, 352-247-9200. That's 352 247 9200.